safe. Okay, we're here, we're here. Right now, it's go time. Should I be concerned about my security? This hasn't actually ever been filmed before. Good morning. Is the root of all evil. We're heading to meet the owner of a drug operation. Do you have a phone? I do. I'd like to have it. What's happening? The belly of the beast. Esconder completamente tu identidad y nadie va a saber. Mm -hmm. uh, we're thinking of taking our cameras and robbing them. Thing, of course. I don't know how to feel about this. What are you going to do with $19.42 million? They were billionaires before Bill Gates. This is the infamous human experiment lab. It is pues porque ahora tienes confianza en mí. Pues no tengo confianza. No, pero estamos usando lo que siempre no. Vivo no van a salir. It's military grade. It's no. Being superhuman is the game. It's a massive, massive fraud. This town was built on coke money. Sounds like money to me, no? No one knows what's going on behind closed doors. Welcome, everyone, to this fabulous discussion with this fabulous woman, Mariana Von Zeller. She is someone I have long admired, and she is host of a new series on Nat Geo um, called Trafficked, and it is incredible, and it is a multi-part series. But um, before we start our conversation, Mariana, I just want to give the folks a, a, an understanding of your body of work. I mean, you are a, a Peabody winning, a DuPont winning, um, globe trotting, badass of a journalist. Um, you've covered basically, I think your beat is the dark underbelly of, of global, you know, uh, syndicates. Um, but you've done it uh, to perfection here. And I'm so impressed by the series. So I'm, I'm excited to talk about it with you. First of all, welcome. I hope you're holding up well during the pandemic. I am. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Juju. I'm also a huge fan of yours. So it's my pleasure to be here today. So I want to start with sort of the through line, if you will, because your topics are so diverse. Um, obviously, everything from um, steroids, uh, fentanyl, guns, uh, sex workers, counterfeiting. What is the through line through it? And what, what were you looking at uh, to bring it together as a theme? Black markets, essentially, uh, global black markets. So one thing that I think most people don't know is that while the formal economy is sort of uh, very, there's whole organizations and magazines and TV channels devoted to analyzing every up and down and twist and turn and IPO and everything that happens in the formal economy, there is not much that we know about the informal economy, and yet it makes for ups for, for almost half of the global economy. So the idea behind the show is to sort of really go deep into these black and gray markets, more black markets in this case, and try to figure out how they work, how the power structures work, who are the operators, who are the traffickers and smugglers, and see um, what we can learn from these markets and 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 worlds and underworlds, and and what sort of a. Uh, uh, um, uh, people are operating in them. So a big part of the show is not only about the markets themselves, but more importantly than anything is the people who live in these markets. And I'm curious how much overlap there is for you, because you often talk about your contacts or your sources in, in these underground markets. How much do they overlap with each other and how, how do they work together? There is a little overlap in the sense that uh, you know, if you're trading in one illegal good, you're also sort of dabbling in others. Sometimes that's not always the case, but it was actually pretty fascinating to see in some cases. For example, one of the scammers, we did one of the episodes about scamming and we filmed in both Jamaica and Israel. And one of the scammers we spoke to, his name was Victor, and he was sort of a leader. He had several, uh, a little organization with different scammers working for him and sort of paying him. But he started out as an individual scammer. And he says that he was actually in the drug trade before, but he realized that there was much more money to be made in scamming in Jamaica than in the drug trade. So he went over to scamming. Um, but yeah, you see some overlap sometimes, for sure. That's fascinating. Um, I know that we have a little two minute clip of the scammers thing. Do you want to play that now? Yes, it would be great. So what do you do, Victor? Well, you know what I do, I'm in the game. 
You call it scam, we call it the money game. How long have you been in the money game for? More than 12 years. We just left high school. We didn't have no jobs at the time and we were getting in so much trouble, so we decided to want to try with something new. Do you remember the first time you did it? Oh, sure. On the phones, I met a guy, I think his name was Mike. First time he sent me like a $500. I couldn't believe it. First day of my life in this game, the amount of money I see. Since those early days, Victor has risen to become what he describes as a mid-level boss. How has the state of emergency affected you guys? Oh, my team has to scatter, man. Otherwise, you'd come and see about 10 guys right here right now. Really? I'm more, yeah. I have more than 200 people under my organization. 200 people working for you? Probably more. No way. <laughs> of course. Behind all the swagger is a young man who says he grew up on the rough side of Montego Bay with very few options. The most reason why we do this is just for survival. We have such a huge history of being broke and stuff like that, things taken from us, so, you know what I mean? Sometimes we just look at it as taking some back. In other words, reparations. The idea that scamming white people is payback for a brutal history of slavery and colonialism. It's a justification that I heard from Tweedy as well. It's also the title of perhaps the biggest scammer anthem of them all. Pat Carter, yeah, reparation. It's my song. It's my job. Big old heavy scammer. We make you a dollar. I love that song. I used to play it every morning just for like giving me energy to go through the day. Have you ever had to hurt anyone because of scamming? I never really have to take anyone's life through scamming, but I read really roughed up and hurt people and stuff like that. I'm just finding a way to make some money, otherwise I'll be going out there trying to rob somebody. I was even thinking about doing it today, but I'm thinking you're a very nice person. Wait, so you were far. thinking of taking our cameras and robbing Everything, me? Everything, of course. said that he was going to rob from you. Yes, that's right. I yeah. mean, what went through your mind in that moment? It was uh, unsettling. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. Uh, we arrived on location. We knew we were meeting this sort of dangerous man. He was surrounded by his bodyguards who were armed. Um, I, the best thing to do in those situations, and I've learned this through experience because I've been doing this for over 15 years and reporting on these worlds, is to show the person that you're with that you trust them, that you know that at that point, at that moment in time, your security is sort of in their hands, but that you're there to listen to their story and that you trust them. And that's what I did. I went straight up to him. I started talking. I started putting on a microphone on him and immediately talking and immediately telling him, making it very clear that I was not there to judge him, that I was there uh, more with empathy um, and uh, really and curiosity and really wanting to listen to what his story and what he had to say. And so I sit down and as I start hearing him, that's when he essentially tells me that he was thinking of robbing me. And then he said I was a nice person. And so he decided not to. But again, it's this idea that if you sort of trust them and treat them with respect, you'll be trusted back and treated with respect back. I have so many questions coming out of that vignette. But first, I know that as you were miking him, he said something to the effect of like, I'm letting you do this because you're a woman. Mm -hmm. um, how often when you're in these incredibly, what feels to me dangerous situations, does it actually help you to be a woman? I say almost every, always, almost. I mean, there, very, there have been some situations where I've not been allowed in because I was a woman, um, which have frustrated me endlessly. But mostly, you know what it is, Juju? And I think you're probably, you've experienced this as well, I'm sure, is that I think they, they we're less threatening um, to, to people that we talk to, right? Especially in these underworlds. I feel like what we are, we present as less threatening. And so there's just a more, a, a more likelihood that they will sit out, uh, down want to talk to us and sort of opening open up to us so i always feel that it's all it's been an advantage and in in that situation i truly feel that he treated me differently and with uh you know perhaps he even didn't rob us because because i was a woman in that case so and you treated him with dignity but at the same time i can understand why he would trust you but what is the mental calculus you go through in order to trust him and how when do you put your safety and your life in the criminal underworld's hands, basically. It's 
there's a lot that you don't see. There's the months and years that go into getting people to talk to us. We get so many no's. People always ask, you know, it seems like so easy. How did you get such easy access? It's not easy. It's months, sometimes even years, again, of, of sort of, you know, knocking on doors, talking to people and trying after try after try after try to get access to these worlds and to, talk, to get people to talk to us. But once they do, um, I think one of the most important things that they always want, want to try to figure out is if you really are a journalist. Um, it is that you're law enforcement pretending you're a journalist. So we always have what I call the under, our first underground dates, uh, underground first dates, in which they want to meet either the whole crew or sometimes even just me. And they want to try to figure out again if they can trust me and uh, if I'm in fact a journalist or law enforcement. And this happens with everyone. And, and, and sometimes there's a no, a lot of times actually there's a no, or, or there's a yes and then they ghost those the next day and they never show up. And, and what goes into the yes, do you think? Is it ego? Is it, let me justify my presence? Is it, what is it that they're motivated by? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, partly ego, for sure. Um, partly because there's somebody that is willing to listen to their stories. I think, you know, these are the most stereotyped and sort of shunned people in our society, right? These outlaws, it's we call criminals as well. Um, and they, they were, they're given an opportunity in this case to talk to National Geographic. Um, and they have a, a person there that's willing to listen to their stories. And uh, they a lot of times just want to tell us that, you know, this is why I do what I do because of a lack of opportunities, because I grew in this in, up in this environment to this family. And this is what I was surrounded with when I was growing up. And I am not a bad person. You know, so that happens a lot too. There's is it this need to show that, you know, I know you think that me I was a bad person, but here's my opportunity to explain otherwise. And in the scammers piece, they talk about reparations, that this mm -hmm. is something that, you know, is owed to us. We're scamming white people because they've done harm to our community. Yeah, absolutely. That was, I heard that again and again. So we ended up actually interviewing a handful of scammers in Jamaica and, uh, the, the interviews were so eye-opening and it was so not what I expected them to be. You know, as journalists usually go to do these stories with some sort of a preconceived idea of what it's going to be. And uh, this was totally not, not what I expected. One of the interviews that I'll never forget was with this uh, female scammer called Tweety. And uh, again, she talked about the idea of reparations, which is that, you know, they, they were exploited for so many years. Jamaica was exploited so many years that now is their time for sort of payback. They're, they're scamming Americans because they're owed that money. And Tweety tells a story about how she actually, during the day, works at this luxury resort in Jamaica and uh, was realized pretty early on that Americans were spending more money in one day at the resort than she made in a whole year of working at that resort. And one day she comes back home and her grandfather, who she's very close with, is very, very sick. And she, the treatment to save his life isn't very costly, but she, she just can't afford it. And she's the only person in her family that works. And uh, she realized the only way she could pay back or pay for her grandfather's treatment and save his life is to scam because that's the only other opportunity she has to make fast money in Jamaica in her case. This is her talking. And so she did it. And in her case, she says, look, Jamaicans are very religious. I grew up in a very religious family. And everybody told, told me that we had, you know, God was going to deliver, you know, and no, God didn't deliver. And in my family, I am God. And I was the one who had to save my grandfather. That's fascinating. I, I, I'm curious too, you, you find so many, um, eye-opening uh, ca characters, human beings along the route, like in the in the drug mules that you um, interview, and even with the gun runners on some episodes, a lot of them are mothers. Um, tell us about sort of your thoughts on that and what, what, what you took away from those encounters. Yeah, it's it was super surprising to me. So one of the episodes we did was about gun runners or uh, gun trafficking, and it was American guns going down to Mexico and how they're responsible for the, you know, partly responsible for the enormous amounts of deaths that exist in Mexico and all throughout Latin America. But um, we went to one of the first meetings we had that we filmed for that episode was uh, we contacted our sources and uh, we'd been told that, okay, they'd agree to let us film sort of the pipeline, partly because they wanted to show us that even though the U.S. tends to sometimes demonize Mexicans for the drug uh, trade, that they wanted to show that what is happening in Mexico is happening partly because of American guns and, um, and how they are helping 
the gun trade essentially and play a large part in the gun trade. So that's why they opened up access for us to film the whole pipeline of guns going from the United States down to Sinaloa, Mexico. And so one of the first interviews we did for that, they told us, okay, you can, you're going to meet a, drug, a gun mule, a person who basically transports guns down from the US to Mexico. And at this location, this time, we got there and I went and walked into the car and it was a woman and I wasn't expecting it. And uh, she told us that this is what we crosses with guns um, on a weekly or biweekly uh, rate. And, um, and then she actually brings drugs back. And then fast forward, we did another episode on fentanyl and the same situation where we went to meet a drug mule and it was another woman. And this, what they told us is that actually to go through the border, because most of the guns and the drugs go through the regular you know, border, that it's just easier to do so as a woman. And in the second case, when we filmed uh, the woman with a car packed with fentanyl crossing into the United States, she was actually uh, an American citizen and she was pregnant at the time. And she said that actually she had other kids and that when she's pregnant, it's the best time to do it because it's when uh, they're less suspicious. You, um, in the fentanyl episode, managed to go from, follow the pipeline, so to speak, as the fentanyl is, is literally being cooked uh, and then being shipped over. And you talk about how they are um, sort of blind to uh, the other steps so as to keep the secrecy. Yeah. Um, and, and you really sort of stop short in trying to, like you, you say, I want to read those labels. We want to know where all of it is coming from. At what point do you worry that you might sort of, um, I don't know, antagonize the Sinaloa cartel or, you know, some some powerful force um, that may or may not be coming from countries like China um, who that may or may not have pharmaceutical grade fentanyl coming through? I mean, it sounds like you have to really um, sort of skirt those edges all the time. You do. That's a very good question. You do. But at the same time, you're also there to do your job as a journalist. Right. So you have to be very careful with not asking. So there's questions, you know, that you're not supposed to ask whenever you're working with cartels in Mexico. You don't ask what cartel they belong to. That's a question that, you know, you're not supposed and they tell you that beforehand. And if you've ever worked in Mexico, you know, that's the case. And yet I ask it every time. Um, and usually it's, you know, because I, but I don't ask it off the bat. I don't ask, it's not my first question. I spend time with them. I learn about them. I learn about their operations. And then towards the end, when I feel like there's some trust there, then I ask them. And, and usually it's, you know, sorry, not answering that question, but I think that's, you know, valuable in itself. Um, and in some cases they actually tell you, and it's uh, not who you'd expect. There was one situation where we were filming the pipeline of guns again and we thought we were filming with the Sinaloa cartel because they had given us access and it turns out that it was from a rival cartel but they had sort of an alliance together which I didn't know beforehand. I um, you know every year go to the you know um, committee to protect journalists events and things you know journalists are under fire uh, in a lot of the countries that you visited let me tick a few off right you went to Peru, Colombia, Mexico, Jamaica Israel, Thailand, Laos. Um, do you worry not about your physical safety in the moment, but about retaliation or being in their crosshairs down the line? I don't know which is more scary. I worry more about the local journalists, to tell you the truth, because we depend a lot on local journalists when we're doing this kind of reporting. If I, when we start looking into a subject that we that I haven't reported on or our team hasn't reported on yet and we don't know a lot about, the first phone call you make is to a local journalist, right? What we call fixers in our industry. Sure. And, and uh, they are the ones that take, you know, be, and, and usually it's people who've reported on this, have contacts and sort of can help us be our guide in these worlds. And they're the unsung heroes. You know, they are the ones who are, uh, you know, risking most of it, truly, because we come back to the United States and we're protected here and they stay in their country. So we are very, very careful in this. We take this very seriously with making sure that when we are told not to film certain areas, that we don't film them, that when we're asked to disguise, we go to full measures to disguise people's faces, to change their voices, to make absolutely sure that there is no one that down the line is going to be unhappy with what they saw in terms of revealing identity. Um, of course, the content, uh, we, where we have editorial control over the content, but in terms of revealing who it was who talked to us and protecting our sources. And ultimately, one of the big reasons we do that is not only for our protection, but it's for the protection of the local journalists that stay behind.
And so I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. There are so many people who put their lives on the line day in and day out. And yet when you're in that moment, I don't see you wearing body armor, right? I, I, I see you in very dangerous situations. What do you do with that fear or that adrenaline when you're in that moment of danger and you have to keep thinking? You know, a lot of people, they're doing, their minds just go blank. How, how do you focus like that? I think one of the most important things, again, if you show that you trust them, they will trust you back. If you respect them, they will respect you. If you show up with bodyguards and, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, armor, and if you show that you're scared and you're afraid and you're uncomfortable around them, uh, then that's not going to make the situation better at all. So I think the best advice I always have in these situations, and I we've spoken about this in our team as well, is don't don't show up protected as if you're going to war when you're about to just interview somebody that works in these black markets, because then they are going to think, wait, they're afraid of me. So then, you know, we, we, how, how can I trust people who are here and who are afraid of me? And should I be afraid of them, too? So it's really, it's a give and take. If, if you're just there as a person, as a curious individual with empathy, with a heart, <laughs> and, uh, and, and who is there just to listen to their stories, uh, that goes such a long way. Um, there's such a modern twist to a couple of your pieces when social media plays such a big role. Like in your steroids episode, you really dig deep into how st uh, social media plays into it, but also in pimps. And, and some of the sex workers you meet, you meet through social media and they sell their wares on social media. What, what was your reaction to that aspect of it? Absolutely. Sexual worker, sex workers and pimps themselves. And that was uh, mind blowing. We were trying, we decided we wanted to do an episode on sex trafficking, but mostly sort of uh, spending time with the pimps themselves um, and trying to figure out how they operate, why they do what they do. And and try to see that side of the coin. And um, we, we, it's not exactly we can call a friend and say, hey, do you know any pimps? <laughs> can you give us some contacts for pimps? Actually, you are the kind of person who could do that. <laughs> Remarkably. <laughs> so we started looking online. We contacted a few people. We hit dead ends. And then we started looking online. And it turns out that social media has become sort of an asset for pimps. They uh promote their wares as you said they promote their business on social media they recruit women on social media uh by showing off their lifestyle the amount of money they make the jewelry they have um and and the parties they go to and that was one one of the big ways that they promote their and recruit women and that was i had no idea this was happening so we go online and we start messaging and i think our producer laura actually messaged over 100 pimps or something it was Crazy, and then only a few of them actually agree to talk to us, and then even fewer of those agree to actually sit down and be interviewed. Um, and and what's happening right, which was also mind blowing to me, is that so much of these black markets that we investigated actually happened just a few blocks from a few blocks, no, but a few miles from our, my house here in Los Angeles. And I, I realized say, how that's it is. Yeah. yeah, that that was one of the most criminal aspects of it was that right there in the United States, and so much of the. Sex trafficking happens through the United States. Um, I'm curious, draw a line for us. Um, you're growing up in Portugal. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you draw that line through Columbia Journalism School to fusion, through to LA, to obviously Nat Geo, where you are now? But but give us a sense of how does that happen? How does this investigative journalist who, who travels the world um, get formed? <laughs> well, I've decided I wanted to be a journalist when I was 12 years old, <laughs> very young. And it mo ma mo mainly happened, I think, I I've, I've, was always very scared of being ignorant. I always had sort of a thirst for knowledge. And I used to watch the nightly news with my family every night. And I'd see these anchors on Portuguese television just talking about everything that was happening around the world. And I just thought they were the most knowledgeable people in the entire world. I didn't know they were reading from a teleprompter. So I thought they just <laughs> memorized everything. And so I decided, I told my parents, okay, this is it. I want to be a journalist. And then I knew I wanted to go to Columbia University's journalism school. I went to college in Portugal. And then when I graduated, I started applying for Columbia University. And I didn't get in the first year, didn't get in the second year, the third year. I flew to New York and I knocked on the dean's door, introduced myself. He sat me down. We spoke for an hour in that year. I was accepted. So that taught me my first lesson in journalism and in life in general, which is persistence and don't give up. And then don't after that, for an answer. Yeah, yeah. exactly. 
Yeah. And then after that, it was 9-11. 9-11 happened a month into uh, my program at Columbia. And I was in New York. I was the only Portuguese journalist in Manhattan at the time. So the TV station that I had interned in Portugal called me and asked me to do all the live reporting uh, from Manhattan. Um, and that totally changed me because until then, I thought I wanted to do more nightly news reporting. Um, and the, mo the day that I did all the live reporting for Portugal and I walked down, uh, to the streets of Manhattan, I saw people with signs looking for their loved ones. And uh, me, like every other person in New York and in the world, completely broke down. And I realized that actually the kind of reporting that I wanted to do was sort of more long form uh, documentaries to be able to contextualize what was happening. And a year later, I moved to Syria. Well, that's a very quiet place to move to with that. <laughs> and so pre-war. Yeah, pre-war. Um, I'm curious. I mean, you've you've partnered with Nat Geo in many ways. It feels like the perfect partnership because of this idea of Nat Geo explorers, and you really are exploring this underworld in a way. Uh, and I'm wondering why viewers should watch. Why do we need to see this, as you say, 50% of the global economy in action? You know, um, and why, why is it important for us to understand that world that you're exploring? Because it's all around us. Black markets literally exist all around us. Um, they're prevalent. They're widespread. Uh, they have a huge impact on our daily lives, whether we know it or not. Um, you can be walking around right now with a fake $100 bill in your pocket and not know it. You, your next door neighbor can be a victim of sex trafficking right now. Um, you know, there are fentanyl deals happening outside your door. And th none of this is meant to scare anyone. I think people ask me, oh, is this a sad and depressing show? And um, no, absolutely not. It's not sad and depressing. I think it gives us knowledge. It's super compelling. It's an, it's exciting. And it is uh, um, important in the sense that only by knowing how these worlds operate and these power structures operate, are you able to uh, sort of address them, right? And knowing the root causes, are you able to address these problems and, and sort of try to figure out how to stop these black markets. Um, and another thing is the people that we've met along the way in these black markets. I mean, you, you, there are moments that I've been, uh, of course, there are a lot of bad people and we've met a lot of bad people doing horrific things, but through the show, you'll meet people that are incredibly inspirational as well, um, who sort of play roles, either trying to stop, you know, there was one part that I'll never forget when we were doing the gun uh, trafficking episode and we ended up the episode by interviewing these women who are called Sabuesas Guerreras in Mexico, um, hounds, um, uh, I can't remember how you could be called, translated to English, but essentially they go out every day looking, and these are all mothers, mostly mothers, who go out looking for remains, body remains. And it's led by this one particular woman whose uh, son uh, disappeared, and she's pretty sure, and he was a policeman, and she was pretty sure he was killed by the cartel. And she says that she was in total depression for a few months, and then she had a dream that her son was speaking to her and says, go find me, go find me. So that day she started this organization. She goes out looking and basically digging in what in areas that are believed to have, have mass graves, digging, looking for remains to then be analyzed and figure out if it's her son. And I asked her, what, you know, do you hope every time you find these remains, do you hope that it's your son? And it was such a silly question, I realized as soon as I asked it, because she looked at me and said, no, because obviously my hope is to still find him alive. Um, so, you know, there's these incredibly mm. inspirational and beautiful stories as well. Sure, sure. What, I mean, if you could get personal for a moment, what were the most difficult, what was the most difficult episode for you to cover? What was, what was toughest? I think the fentanyl episode. You know, I've been covering the opiate crisis for over 12 years. Um, my first report was called the Oxy Oxycontin Express, was back in 2009. And uh, and then I've did, done follow-ups on heroin abuse and fentanyl abuse here in the United States. And I have spent so much time with the mothers, uh, especially mothers, particularly mothers who've lost their loved ones to fentanyl overdoses. And being and seeing the pipeline. So in the episode, we actually follow the whole pipeline from when barrels are being thrown. I think you have a clip, right? Yes. So I won't ruin it, but you'll see the beginning of where that pipeline starts. And then we follow the whole pipeline up. And then I can tell you an episode about it that was the hardest for me to film. There's a 
boat that I think might be the people we're meeting. This boat right ahead with uh, two, three, three or four guys inside. There are cargo ships all around us. There's a fishing boat right here. And then we see it. Oh my Lord. A row of large plastic barrels floating towards the small tourist boat we've been following. Barrels that have been tossed from the stern of a rust-covered fishing trawler nearby. There were about 10 barrels, white barrels, that were thrown out to sea. Packed inside are the potent chemicals the cartels need to create fentanyl. I mean, it's so crazy. You look at it and it just looks like a totally normal fishing boat. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of them around the coast of Mexico. In a way, it's sort of the perfect crime because it's so indistinguishable. It would never raise any alarm. When we started filming Traffic, I decided pretty early on that I wanted one of the episodes to be about fentanyl because it's the most dangerous uh, drug in America. Um, and I knew I wanted, you know, I'd covered it here in the US, but I'd never done the whole sort of pipeline. And I knew uh, that there was so much drug actually gets here to the United States. So the first part of the process that we were at, actually able to film, and I believe, um, you know, it was incredible access. I still can't believe we were able to film this. But it was uh, out in the ocean. Um, we, we saw this trawler, this fishing trawler, throwing out these huge barrels out into the water. And then you saw these fishing boats, small sort of speed boats coming up and picking these barrels. And we, do, we arrived exactly at the moment that the speed boat was picking up these barrels. And I went and started asking and we knew what was in the barrels, but we had a, a short conversation with the people and it was all precursor chemicals for fentanyl that were coming possibly from China. We were never able, they never let us see the whole, uh, uh, you know, what was written outside, which I was trying very hard to, but we believe they were coming from, from China, essentially, which was been reported where the majority of these precursor chemicals are coming from. And then we saw it all going to a stash house and then going into a lab. And we saw the process of making fentanyl in an illicit lab. And then we saw it being packed on the border between Mexico and the US. And then we saw it being uh, moved into the U.S. And that was the hardest part for me to to film. And I can talk about it if you want. Sure. Why, why was that the hardest part? Because I, I know you've seen the destruction that opioids have had uh, on humanity in general. Absolutely. And so the mo the person that was actually uh, uh, trafficking the, 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 the drugs, and in this case was five kilos of fentanyl in her car, was a woman, pregnant, had other kids as well. And there's this moment where we're actually behind her, close to her, and we can see her go through the border and where, where our cameras are obviously down, we're not filming up, but I'm seeing what's happening and the camera is down here. Uh, obviously we don't want to call any attention to what's happening. And it was a crazy moment where she's stopped and asked to go to secondary inspection. And my heart starts beating really fast. And on the, I'm completely torn in this moment thinking, I just spent a day with this woman. She's allowing us to film this, and you know, I, I think you, you're you 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 you. It is impossible not to meet these people, talk to them, listen to their stories, and not have some sort of a connection or feel some sort of a connection to them, one way or another. And so, on the one hand, I you know, it's tough if she's about to go get arrested and she's going to do a long time in prison and she has kids and she has a family to feed. And on the other hand, I kept on thinking that I can't be there. Uh, wishing that she goes across the border and nothing happens to her because I'm thinking about all the mothers that I'd spent time with who'd lost loved ones and I know exactly the impact that these drugs can have in the United States. And I kept thinking, what will the, those mothers, how will they judge me right now for how I'm feeling about this woman? Mm, wow. And it was really tough. It was one of the toughest things we had to film, for sure. That's amazing. And yet, if you had a magic wand, Mariana, what would you do to stop this kind of illicit trafficking? address the root causes. I don't think anyone is born wanting to be a criminal or an outlaw. Uh, I really don't. And the more I speak to people, the more I realize that's the case. You know, one one person we interviewed, we spent a night, um, we did one of the episodes was about cocaine trafficking. And we spent a night with these mochileros, backpackers in the Vrame Valley in Peru, where a lot of the cocaine that comes to America comes from. And uh, we were camping out with them. And uh, I started asking them, you know, these are 16, 17 year old kids that take carry these backpacks with kilos and kilos of cocaine. It's back breaking work for days on end out of the jungles of Peru and out to be transported into the United States. 
and they're killed by rival uh, rival groups. You know, they've seen their best friends being killed in front of them. It's incredibly dangerous work. And and I asked them, so why why do you do this? And they said, look, one of them told me, made it very clear. Look, I grew up in a very poor family and I always wanted to go to college. And I realized pretty early on that there was no way that my family could afford that. So there is no job opportunities whatsoever ever here in the Brain Valley. The whole economy is devoted to coca plantations and cocaine smuggling and, tra- and ma- producing illegal cocaine and cocaine trafficking. So the only way that I could make any sort of cash was by doing this. And, uh, and I'm hoping I can save it to go to college. And I asked him, why do you want to go to college? And he said, because I want to be a dentist, because I want to make people smile. So yeah, you hear these stories, and I, this is not a, a unique story. Right. I hear these stories again and again. And so when you yeah. hear these stories, you realize if you don't address the root causes, if you don't right. realize that w- the work and the money and the resources need to go to again to the lo- to the places uh, in, ter- in terms of you know making there more opportunities, making the economy stronger, so that you don't have to resort to the black market. I um, speaking of the black market, I. I com- I'm aware of the fact that steroids are an issue, but what surprised you in, in that particular episode in terms of how massive an I- a problem it is? The amount of people that are doing, the type of people and the amount of people that are doing steroids is mind blowing. I had no idea. So I was under the impression, perhaps from ignorance, that it was mainly sort of, you know, like gym rats and bodybuilders. Uh, but we spoke to, uh, you know, suburban moms, uh, teens, uh, teenagers, who, you know, were still in high school doing steroids. Um, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, and, and just the fact that it's everywhere. I mean, we saw deals happening in gyms. We saw a guy, a steroid dealer in his car going from gym to gym, selling in a parking lot out in the open. Uh, selling steroids to a school dad, to a dad that he'd met through his kid's school. And he went up to him and says, hey, how are you? And we were listening. And by the way, everybody, the participants knew that we were listening in on the conversation. But it was, hey, how are you kids? How's school? Yeah, all good. Here, here's your steroids. And here's this and that. And it happened right there out in the open. And that I was not expecting. That's it, It's really remarkable. Tell me a little bit about your team. This is eight episodes that I read you did in two years, which is most people may not understand the breakneck speed of that. How how big a team do you have? How many things? I mean, were you going from shoot to shoot? Were you going from story to story linearly or were you leapfrogging? It was eight episodes done in 10 months, Juju. Not two years. Hats <laughs> off. Hats off. Well, where did I read two years? That's crazy. Insanity. I yeah, it was two, it was ten months and then a couple of pickup shots at the end. So yeah, the whole thing was less than a year essentially. It was crazy. It, we're traveling all the time. I'm used to working with smaller uh, teams. Usually, you know, reporting in these worlds, it's usually a crew of two or three people maximum. And in this case, we decided, and it was sort of a challenge that Nagio put to us. Uh, you know, can you travel with a bigger team? And uh, can you and 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 make it even more sort of premium quality visually. And I was incredibly lucky to find these incredibly talented people who are now part of my family because we've traveled all around the world together. Um, and they're, I mean, it's uh, the, the director of photography alone just is, it's just such a pleasure to see him work because he's so incredibly talented. He was one of the DPs for uh, Parts Unknown with Anthony Bourdain, his name is Fred. Uh. He's a French uh, filmmaker and he's so good. And just seeing, you know, I, I'm used to getting to these spots, you know, you're filming an illicit lab and you're doing everything you can quickly. But we get in there and he does everything quickly, it takes a little bit more time, but just makes everything also look so beautiful, but also not taking away the rawness of what it actually is. And just the details that they're able to capture that you wouldn't think, but that say so much about the place, you know? Totally, it's yeah, really it's the little details. You really have to pay attention yeah. um, to, to notice them or not, actually. Yeah. The opposite is also true. You don't need to pay attention, but it speaks to you on a subconscious level, on some level. Absolutely. I'm always the one who's like, okay, guys, time to go. And they're like, <laughs> wait, give me a second, just filming and then something. And then I see it when we get back. It's like, okay, I get now what you're filming and why you were doing that. <laughs> but it's as if Nat Geo added booster rockets to your already snazzy race car. It's, it's so true. You know, we, we get all the time people saying when they've seen the trailer and parts of the episode that it looks like a, a Hollywood movie. And it's solely because of their incredible work. It's really props to them. 
But the storytelling is there and that's all you. It's still very much a human endeavor and you connect with these people in such a, a fascinating way. Um, I understand too, you're doing a companion podcast. I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I would just like to say that I also have an incredible team of producers and directors who are also involved in the storytelling. So it's not on me, but feel, uh, feel free to <laughs> brag about as many people as you want. <laughs> uh, and we're doing a companion podcast. It's so funny. I, it's my first endeavor, our first foray into the podcast, and it's really it's such a I love I love the idea and I love the podcast. So we are almost done. They start it starts premiering this week as well, and it's uh, comes out every Thursday wherever you get your podcast. Podcast, but it's we interview. I interview a, a former trafficker and sort of the rise and fall of this trafficker. So we interview Tony Bosch, uh, who was a big steroids dealer in the pro baseball world. Uh, Heidi Fleiss, the former madam, uh, a former cocaine, one of the original cocaine tra uh, um, cocaine cowboys, and so on. But it was so funny because I've done you know hundreds and hundreds of interviews uh, in my lifetime, and the first time that I sit down to do one of these podcast interviews, I was so nervous. I was, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do this because I'm also obsessed with podcasts. I listen to podcasts all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really nervous. But be somebody else. I find that is interesting when you try to, okay, I've listened to all these podcasts and I have to sound like what I've been hearing. And I did that in television in the early days, days of my career as well, where I was trying to be somebody that I wasn't. And yeah, it's a, a big message is just be who you are, be, you know, everybody else is already taken. Um, give us a, uh, I mean, it, it, is it oversimplified to say that gun, that drugs go north and gu guns go south, or is it, is it more complicated than that? No, it's not, not, not much more complicated than that, unfortunately. Right. Uh, that is the case. Uh, you have uh, guns and money going south and drugs coming up north. And that's done usually throughout the official ports of entry. But as we know, uh, you know, tunnels are being dug every day. Uh, I mean, Smuggling is happening all around, and what and and yet human trafficking, sex trafficking, is truly global. It is truly global, but I don't think most people, Americans, know how uh, actually there are more American sex trafficking victims in the United States than they are international or foreign sex trafficking victims. That is very much an American problem as well, and that it's happening again all around us. And would you agree that even for those kinds of issues, addressing root problems are, are, are perhaps the most effective way of dealing with it? Because I know well, you, you talk to the detective as you're driving along, like, do you go after Johns? Do you go after pimps? Do you go after, how do you break down these syndicates, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I'd be curious what you think the answer should be. I think addressing the root problems always. Um, but it was interesting. He, in that case with the detective, he had tried several things and sort of it wasn't working. He had gone after initially uh, the, the, the sex traffic, the, the, actually the sex workers on the streets. Sure. And, and they tried to get them to talk about their pimps because a lot of them, the majority of them actually have pimps or have sex traffickers in some cases. And uh, and they weren't willing to talk and they were imprisoning sex workers, which is, you know, we've seen that's not the right answer. And then they started going after the Johns, uh, which I do think actually going after the demand is crucial as well. Um, and then they realize actually the bigger problem here is sort of the network that exists behind this. And it's the pimps with all these women working for them. And how can we go after the pimps? So they're trying to go after the pimps, but it's not always easy. Right. Um, what do you think ultimately you would want people to take away from the series? If you feel like, oh, I've done a good job if fill in the blank. You know, uh, it's, Again, you talk about, mar about black markets and you might think that this is a depressing, um, very sad show. And I think my main takeaway from this is that I want people to connect with other people. This is one of the main reasons I became a journalist. Um, I feel a an enormous sort of uh, wish that people by watch watching this show will be able to connect to people who might at first look look exactly the opposite of what we are. They, you know... Uh, might go live in far off places doing things completely different, be so different from who we are. And yet um, I think the show will, will show that you, you're, if you sit down and you listen to their stories and you try to walk in their shoes, um, that you'll be able to connect with them just as I did. 
And so uh, what that bad one thing, which I think is important, doesn't mean I condone what they do and we shouldn't. Uh, but we should at least try to understand them because without understanding, we'll never be able to address it. Sure. And how has the pandemic played out? I mean, clearly you finished shooting at some point before the pandemic. Actually, we've been filming for season two during the pandemic. We started filming again starting in July. And <laughs> I was unsure how it was going to work out. I, the world had changed so much, I, I thought, through after those first few months of quarantine, that I was sort of fearful when we went back on the field to report, thinking, what are we going to find? Are there still black markets? Are they still operating? But what we actually found is that there's been an explosion of black markets because of uh, COVID. Uh, whenever there's an economic downturn, whenever people can't feed their families and don't, you know, don't have money to bring back home um, and have to figure out a way to survive, that's when they turn to black markets. So I think this series right now is more relevant than ever. And how are you shooting? Um with COVID conditions, because I know that a lot of the places that you've traveled have very, very high rates of COVID transmission. Yeah, it's already such a challenging show to put together just in terms of gaining access to these worlds and all the sensitivities that are uh, that come with it, um, that it just added one more challenge. But it's uh, we've been filming since July. Um, we all do the all we have a very, you know, high uh, uh, we have, you know, weekly phone calls. We travel with all our PPE. Everybody wears masks. There's a whole security procedure in place to make sure that none of us um, get infected and that we're not infecting anyone. We take that very, very, very seriously. And uh, so far, uh, we've all been able to stay COVID-free. And um, and again, you know, you you think perhaps this is not the right time to be doing this kind of reporting, but what it has shown me is that this is exactly the right time. Sex trafficking has only increased, uh, drug trafficking, the same thing. I mean, there really has been an explosion in black markets. It's so true that desperation breeds um, criminal activity all the time. Um, I just wanna make sure that, you know, we let people know that not only is um, your series, uh, available or are, are airing Wednesdays at nine o'clock on National Geographic um, through mid-January, but it will also be available on demand um, at video on demand as well on the uh, Nat Geo website and on the app so people can click away and binge as I did a number of episodes and, and click through. It's, it, it's really, really remarkable um, an incredibly impressive body of work. Thank you, Juju. Did you say 1 p.m. or 9 p.m.? Um, if I said 1 p.m., that would be mistaken. Um, Wednesdays at 9 o'clock, 8 central on National Geographic, right? Yes. I'm glad you corrected me. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm so happy that the 92nd Street Y convened us because this is the most time I've spent with you, even though we've like passed in the hallways here at ABC. Um, and again, I'm, I'm hugely impressed by it. Good for you. And keep up the great work and stay safe. Thank you so much, Juju. Super appreciate it. It was a pleasure to talk to you. All right. Be well. Take care. Thanks. Yes.